All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today's video, we're gonna be tackling a really popular Belgian beer style and one of my favorites, the Belgian Triple. This is a delicious beer, uh, which is very high in alcohol and just a lot of fun to drink and probably one of the most popular beer styles that I experienced while I was over there. Nearly every other beer available is a triple of some kind or a strong golden nail of some kind. But before we get too deep into it, I do want to point out that there is a big difference between a Belgian blonde, a Belgian triple, and a Belgian golden strong ale. Blondes are lower in alcohol by volume, but they still retain most of the same character of flavor as a triple. Belgian golden strong ales are really pretty much just a very simple, very straightforward, high alcohol, extremely easy drinking, hoppy, dry ale. And the triple is very similar to the Belgian Golden Strong Ale. It's high in alcohol, it's relatively hoppy, it's relatively dry, but there's a lot more malt complexity in it than the Belgian Golden Strong Ale. Golden Strong Ale is like 90% Pilsner malt and then 10% sugars, whereas the Belgian triple can have some extra specialty malts in there to kind of give it a little bit more flavor. And that's kind of what we're going for today. I'm gonna differentiate this from the blonde that I just made by adding a little bit of Munich malt, a little bit of aromatic malt, and of course, a whopping amount of alcohol. We're also gonna be adding a lot more hops into this beer as well. Um, and I'm interested to see how that's gonna turn out. I really like hoppy triples. Um, I think it really kind of brings a whole new characteristic to the forefront of the beer. So we'll see how it goes. I've been having so much fun making this Belgian beer series. Uh, it's just, there's some of my favorite beers and it just brings back great memories of that amazing trip that I took. So check out the playlist up here in the corner if you wanna see all of the other videos in this series. Before we get started on the recipe though, I want to give a big shout out to a couple organizations for help support me and helping make this video possible. First of all, Northern Brewer. They are no longer owned by AB InBev and they provided all of the ingredients I needed for the batch, malt, hops, sugar, yeast, everything. They have a great selection of fantastic ingredients, so check them out when you got some time. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply. They manufacture the system that I used to brew on for the last a year and a half now, it's a fantastic system. I've had nothing but good experiences with it. Um, so check it out in the description box. There's a link down there if you wanna check out the system for yourself. They make both 120 volt and 240 volt options as well um, with uh, plenty of great accessories as well. Lastly, big thank you to Grillaholics for helping support the channel. I don't have a channel on it, and I don't really put out content on it, but I really do enjoy barbecue, smoking meats, grilling things, it's just a lot of fun. Beer and barbecue go hand in hand together. A lot of people do both at the same time. And if you're interested in some high quality barbecue and grilling accessories, please check out Grillaholics. There's a link in the description box, and I think you're gonna be happy with what you see there. Big thank you to them for helping support me as well. So now let's jump into the recipe here. Um, we're gonna be making this up mostly of a base of Pilsner, but I'm gonna be using a new variety of Pilsner malt that I have not tried to use before and was highly motivated to use by Gnome Brewing, and that is franco Belges Pilsner malt. This is a Belgian slash French maltster um, that is uh, supposedly a very, very high quality. I've never brewed with it before and I'm really excited to try it out. So we're gonna start out with 14 pounds of franco Belges Pilsner malt. And then we're gonna add three quarters of a pound of aromatic malt on top of that. Aromatic malt helps really bring out the rich maltiness of Belgian beers. It's kind of a toasted malt in a way, um, and it really is a nice specialty malt to add in small quantities to your beers. On top of that, we're gonna add half a pound of Munich malt. This is just gonna add a little bready kind of undertone, I hope, uh, without adding too much color. We don't want this to be too dark, um, but I'm hoping that it kind of adds a little bit of Interesting complexity to the grist. Also, I just had half a pound left over and was like, you know, throw it in there, see what happens. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna add two pounds of Belgian candy sugar, uh, Simplicity candy sugar specifically. This is the colorless variety of candy sugar. This is gonna go in 10 minutes before the end of the boil. Candy sugar is a traditional ingredient in Belgian brewing. Uh, what it allows you to do is increase the alcohol of the beer without increasing the body um, or the thickness. And also, it helps dry the beer out quite a bit as well, so your final gravity actually ends up dropping lower than you might expect based on uh, just a plain old 100% malt beer. Um, you can use any kind of simple sugar to replicate this one if you want to. Um, if you wanna just use table sugar, that's fine too. I've done that in the past. It doesn't have any ill effects. 
It's just easier for me to use the Simplicity Candy Syrup because the syrup uh, actually breaks down in the boil much, much faster than sugar does. It dissolves very quickly, so that way you don't end up scorching anything on the element. It also comes in these handy one pound packs, which are really easy to uh, use. So for hops, this beer is actually one of the hoppiest uh, of all of the Belgian brews that I'm doing. Um, even though it only has 32 IBUs in it, it's a, gonna be about a 9% beer, and 32 IBUs in a 9% beer is a decent amount of hops. Now these are all noble hops, and I'm trying to really it's kind of squeeze out a decent amount of aroma and flavors. I'm gonna start off with a first wort hop edition of Saz, one ounce of Saz. Um, first wort hopping is something I've done with many Pilsners before. It's a really nice, gentle bitterness that really fits very well in beers that also have a lot of malt complexity, like a Czech Pilsner, for example. Um, but I think it's actually gonna fit really nicely into this triple. And then we're gonna do a bittering edition with one ounce of Hallertau. Uh, that is just a simple 60 minute bittering edition. We're gonna add another ounce of Hallertau at 10 minutes, uh, and then one ounce of Tetnang at zero minutes. Tetnang and Hallertau play together pretty well. Tetnang's a little bit more spicy, a little bit more herbal and Hallertau, um, but I think it's gonna have some really nice aromatics, and I'm excited to see what it does. For the water profile, again, I'm using the same water profile for pretty much all of these beers, just like I'm using the same mash profile for all of these beers. Um, it's just a good standard baseline to use. This water profile is relatively balanced, relatively low in minerals. I think that's what should be done for a Belgian beer. The water profile is 60 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, 18 parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and 47 parts per million of bicarbonate. So in order to get that water profile, I'm actually starting out with eight gallons of spring water this time, not distilled. Um, it, you can use distilled in RO, it'll be fine. There are negligible amounts of uh, minerals in spring water, but that little bit of extra minerality in there may help kind of round out the beer a bit. Um, questionable as to whether that matters, but really I got spring water because they're big five gallon jugs and they're easier to use. Uh, but I'm adding two grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, five grams of calcium chloride, and two grams of baking soda into the water in order to make that water profile happen. For the mash, I'm gonna be using a standard step mash. This is gonna help us get better attenuation and really nice, thick, rich head, I'm hoping. Um, without really increasing the body of the beer. It's gonna be a high alcohol beer, about 9%, so we don't want it to really have too much body as well because then it's just not gonna be as easy to drink. The whole point of the triple and most Belgian beer is to be very easy to drink, um, even though it's very high in alcohol. So the whole point is the beer has to be dangerous, right? So getting a nice, dry, um, very highly fermentable wort is a critical, critical piece of this. And so this mash profile works out pretty well. We're gonna mash it in at 148 degrees Fahrenheit and hold that for 45 minutes. That's a beta amylase rest that's gonna get 90% of our fermentable sugars out of that. Then we're gonna step up to 158 degrees Fahrenheit for a 30 minute rest. That's an alpha amylase rest, but 158 is where all of the beta amylase has been denatured and the alpha can work uninhibited. That's gonna break down longer chain sugars into various random lengths of sugars, which some of which are fermentable, some of which are not, giving you a nice complexity in your beer uh, in terms of residual sugar. And then we're gonna mash out at 170 for 15 minutes. Mashing out at 170 is gonna help really aid in laudering and just getting uh, as good of a efficiency as possible without sparging. So for our yeast in this one, I'm gonna be using a different yeast than the others. I'm, I'm actually gonna be using Lalamand Abbey Ale yeast. This is a dry yeast. Um, it's supposedly the same strain as Fermentus T58 or uh, as Y yeast 1214, uh, as Imperial Monastic. This, this is the Chimay strain of yeast. This is gonna give us a slightly different character than the West Lettering slash West Mall strain uh, that I've used for the other beers. Um, I think this one's gonna be a little less fruity, a little bit more phenolic, but we'll find out. Chimay Sans, uh, their white, their triple, is a really, really good beer. Um, and I kinda wanna see what this is gonna be like in a triple. So. Uh, we'll find out. Anyway, let's go over to the footage of the brew day. I added eight gallons of spring water to my call hammer supply 120 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature. While it was heating up, I measured out all the water salts. I added those to the strike water and I also milled out my grain.
Once my water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with the grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps in the mash and stir thoroughly. After that, I started to recirculate and I let the mash sit at 148 Fahrenheit for 45 minutes. But 10 minutes in, I took a pH reading I saw a higher than planned pH, but not unexpected pH, of 5.7, so I added a few milliliters of lactic acid uh, to bring it back down to an appropriate pH. Once the mash had sat for 35 more minutes, I raised it up to the next mash step of 158 Fahrenheit, and I let it sit there for 30 minutes. Once 30 minutes had elapsed, I raised it to the final step of 170 Fahrenheit and let it rest for 15 minutes. Then I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain for 15 more minutes. I set the controller to 100% power at this time. Using my Anton Parr Easy Dents, I saw a pre-boil gravity of 1064, just two points short of the target. As the wort was heating up to the boil, I added my first word hops. That was one ounce of Saz. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering addition, one ounce of Halitau. Once 50 minutes had elapsed, I added some yeast nutrient, a Whirlflock tablet, my 10 minute hop addition, which was one ounce of Halitau, and the two pounds of Simplicity Candy syrup, being sure to stir that syrup thoroughly until fully dissolved. Ten minutes later, I added my zero minute hop addition, which was one ounce of tetanong. Then I killed the boil by starting to recirculate boiling wort through the chiller and the pump, uh, just the easiest way to make sure everything's all sanitary. After being sure the inside of the chiller and the pump and the tubing were all sterilized, I began to chill down to 65 Fahrenheit. Using the Anton Parr Easy Dents, I saw a original gravity of 1080, which was a little bit short of the intended goal of 1087, but still not bad. I aerated with a dose of about 30 seconds of pure oxygen, and then I pitched my yeast and I left it to ferment. As always, the fermentation of this beer is critical. 90% of this beer's flavor is created during the fermentation, and you cannot skimp out of it. First of all, this is not a beer to pressure ferment. This is also not a beer to use Kvike in. It's just not gonna get you the same result. You're not gonna have the same beer at all. So in order to make a Belgian beer taste like a Belgian beer, you have to use a Belgian yeast. There's no getting around that. So with that out of the way, let's talk about what options you have. So in this case, I'm using the Lalaman Abbey Ale Yeast, the Chimay strain, right? This is also available as Y-East 1214. This is available as Imperial Monastic and WLP 500 uh, from White Labs. And T58 from Fermentis is a, another form of dry yeast. This is a great strain to use for pretty much all Belgian beers. It ferments very nicely. It gives you a nice balance of fruit like apples and pears, as well as some nice spicy phenols like coriander, white pepper, that sort of thing, uh, and clove. Now I've also used Imperial Triple Double, which is the West Letterin and West Mall strain. This is available as YU's 3787, Imperial Triple Double, and WLP 530. This yeast is a little bit fruitier, a little bit more uh, expressive, I think, and it also tolerates higher temperatures a little bit better. Keeping that in mind, I fermented those beers a lot hotter into the high 70s, almost into the 80s in some cases. Whereas this beer, I'm not gonna do that. I'm only gonna raise this one up to about 72 to 75 degrees. 
You can also ferment this beer with uh, a strong golden ale strain like Weiss 1388 or 3522, the Ardennes strain. All of those are good options, but you're gonna need to make sure you understand what the temperature limitations are for that particular yeast. And you also have to ask yourself, how does a brewery that uses that particular yeast to great effect, like Chimay, actually go through their fermentation regimens? That'll tell you what you need to know about the temperature range that you can expect to work with. Like I said, Chimay's strains are gonna be fermented a little bit cooler than West Flutterins, which go up into the 80s. Um, so just, I'm gonna be following that regimen, only going up to about 75. But most cases, you're gonna want to let the yeast kind of free rise to do its thing and then cap it at a certain point. So if you let the yeast get too hot, you can start risking bad fermentation characteristics like fusel alcohols or excessive esters. Um, some strains, again, are more prone to this than others, but you also don't want to keep it too cold or rapidly crash it down a couple degrees at a time because that can cause the yeast to actually stall out. They will actually stop fermenting entirely. They'll flocculate out and the beer won't be finished fermenting. It's not really a good thing. So just try to keep the uh, temperature consistent. So you're going to pitch that yeast nice and cold, let it free rise up to whatever that maximum temperature that you decide is. In my case, this is going to be about 75 degrees. Let it ride it there until it starts to finish fermentation and then naturally cools itself back down. With a beer like the Triple, it's a high alcohol beer, you could see some issues with the fermentation, so make sure you're pitching enough yeast. I am pitching two packets of the Lalamand Abbey Ale yeast. That is a lot of yeast. It's a pitch rate of about one million cells per milliliter per degree Play-Doh, um, which is also gonna get me about, it's a, about four or 500 billion cells for the entire pitch. You wanna make sure that you're pitching enough yeast into this beer, otherwise it can have a bad fermentation, it could stall out on you, you can get bad off flavors. It's just a lot of bad things. Make sure you're also adequately aerating your wort, preferably with beer oxygen if you can do it. Um, it does make a big difference in beers like this. If you don't really take all of these steps, you can end up having an under attenuated beer. It doesn't really reach its final gravity. You can have a lot of off flavors in there that need some time to clean up or may never even go away at all. Um, so just make sure you take care of that fermentation. So my plan is to pitch at 65 degrees Fahrenheit, going all, letting it free rise all the way up to only about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And then from there, letting it naturally finish its fermentation and cool back down, probably down to about 60, which is the ambient temperature in the basement right now. Um, this will probably happen over about two weeks, maybe a little bit longer, at which point I'm gonna taste the beer and see how it's doing. It may be a little estery still, it may need more time to clean things up, so don't panic if this beer takes a little bit longer than two or three weeks to finish up. It's a 9% beer. It's not just a quick turnaround. Once it's good to go, I'm gonna put it in a keg and we're gonna start cold conditioning it for a little bit. It should take maybe one or two weeks to really finish its cold conditioning phase. Then I'm gonna probably bottle condition a couple bottles and put the rest in a keg and see how it goes. So anyway, I'll catch you guys in a few weeks. So the fermentation on the beer went really very well. Um, we had a pretty good attenuation of 82%, came down from an OG of 1080 to a final gravity of 1013 giving 9% ABV on the money. The beer completed its primary fermentation in about 10 days. I actually only saw it get up to about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The beer finished out very quickly and then I put it into a keg for a little bit longer term aging. It sat in a keg in cold conditioning for about a week and a half and then at that point I bottled a whole bunch of it off uh, and then put the rest in the keg to continue carbonating and be on tap. So the beer is called Triple Threat, and it comes in at exactly 9% ABV and 33 IBUs. So for the appearance of the beer, it's this absolutely beautiful, actually quite clear, dark gold. Um, kind of, not exactly orange, but dark gold. It pours with a very, very robust, tight 
white head uh, that has very good head retention. Again, that step mash is working wonders here. It really does look the part of a triple. It, it is pretty clear overall, but it's got a slight haze to it. That's not really gonna go away anytime soon. That being said, I could definitely live with a little haze. I'm not really too upset about that. The head is actually really creamy. It's really nice, tight bubbles in there. Um, and I'm really happy about that. Now, if you're wondering why I'm wearing sunglasses, it's because it's the height of allergy season and one of my eyes decided that it was just not gonna open today. But now we're gonna go in for aroma. The aroma on this beer is actually really nice, very spicy, a little bit of coriander and a lot of orange, like citrus, like bright citrus. You could smell um, also a little bit of a biscuity maltiness to it. Um, I'm actually a pretty big fan of this. Other than that, the aroma is relatively subtle. It's actually mostly malt driven, a little bit of yeast spiciness on top of it. Uh, so now let's move in for mouthfeel. Mouthfeel, oh my God, that's good. <laughs> we'll get to that. The mouthfeel is really, really nice. Um, very spritzy, very light. It doesn't have the uh, kind of creaminess that the Blonde had. It doesn't have that wit beer like character at all. It's a little bit lighter than that. If you remember the Blonde, I actually had some issues with the mouthfeel. It was like more of a medium light character. It's a little too full for the beer. This is right on point. It's lighter than the Blonde. It's like 3% higher in alcohol too, which is uh, equally impressive. Definitely nailed the mouthfeel on this one. High carbonation really does make a huge difference in a beer like this. So now the part that everyone's been waiting for and the part that I'm the most excited to talk to you about, flavor. Mm. Oh. This is a glorious beer. <laughs> um, I don't like to toot my own horn all that much, but this is potentially the best beer I've made in recent memory, like over the last couple years. Um, this is a very good Belgian triple. It checks all the boxes for me. And it is an extremely complex flavor, an extremely good beer. So first of all, the malt character on this is crisp, it's clean, it's bright. It has uh, really, really nice biscuity notes to it at the same time is still remaining light and crisp and uh, it's still remaining semi-sweet, um, but not so sweet that it is offensively sweet. There's also a really pleasant honey-like character to this. So one of the most prominent things I'm really getting is honey biscuit. And then on top of that, we start having these really nice orange, floral kind of notes from the Hallertau uh, and the Tetnang. It literally tastes like a hint of orange blossom honey. Um, it's actually so good. A couple other things here. I'm getting a coriander spice off of this one pretty nicely. Um, I think that is mostly coming from the yeast, although there's a good bit of it that could be coming from the Tetnang. Very pleasant, very rounded, not overly done, um, and it just blends very well with the rest of this beer. And then there's also a little bit of a clove. But then there's also some nice higher alcohol character in there as well. Um, this one is very floral. Ultimately, I'm also getting a chamomile character from the yeast. The Lalamand Abbey Ale yeast really made this beer what it is. This is supremely drinkable, supremely delicious. Um, the floral notes that are in here that combine with the honey character, combining with the uh, just the Belgian yeast characteristics, a little bit of bubble gum in here now that I'm getting as well. Um, it just makes this an absolute joy to drink. It's extremely, extremely flavorful, a very complex beer, at the same time as being extremely refreshing. Um, it is 80 degrees outside right now, and I am enjoying this 9% beer. It feels as refreshing as a 5% light lager. There's also a small amount of like a, um, a white wine-like character. It's a very, very subtle thing. I think it adds another dimension to this beer as well. I'm just absolutely floored at how good this beer is. I don't normally say stuff like that about my beers. I try to remain reserved about them. But honestly, this is probably my favorite beer out of the last two years worth of brewing that I have done. And on top of that, this is easily, easily the best Belgian beer Trappist or otherwise, that I have ever brewed, hands down. This is about a month old now, so as it continues to age, as it continues to develop flavor and complexity, uh, this is gonna continue to get even better. So this is definitely one of the beers that's going into NHC this year. I'm really hoping it does pretty well. So I have bottled off a good portion of this for aging, but the rest of it is in the keg. It is 
extraordinary. <laughs> but overall, I am just absolutely very proud of this beer. I would highly recommend no changes to this recipe. If you like Belgian triples in the classic sense, this is the beer for you. There is absolutely nothing I would change about it. And just so you guys have all the details, when I fermented this, I tried to keep it around 75 degrees at its maximum temperature, and that's about where the yeast wanted to go. So I didn't really have to adjust the fermentation profile at all. It really just kind of did it for me. Two packs of rehydrated Abbey Ale yeast, and this is what you get. It's beers like this that really remind me the most of Belgium and make me want to keep doing stuff like this. But your support also helps me keep going and keeps driving this channel. So I'm asking, please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and comment down below. All of this costs you nothing, but it really helps me out quite a bit. If you want to support the channel in other ways, I also have a t-shirt store. This is one that I put together myself, but I also have plenty of other interesting designs. All of those you can find down below the description box. If you're interested, I get about 30% of the sticker price off of those. Another great way to support me is with a Patreon. My Patreon supporters are really helping out a ton with the production behind this channel. You guys have enabled me to make some pretty significant upgrades in my video editing process, and I really appreciate your support. It continues to do wonders for me. I also have an Amazon store, which is linked in the description box. If you're curious about what kind of equipment that I recommend that's available on Amazon, it's gonna be on that store, so check it out if you're in the market for it. I also have channel memberships now, so if you wanna see what that's like for about two bucks a month, check out the join button that's next to the subscribe button. You get a couple perks, you get to stand out from your peers in the comment section, so it could be kind of cool. Uh, check it out if you're interested. I'm also available on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer, so check that out for more frequent content updates and some additional little goodies every so often. And last but certainly not least, if you are still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. It means a ton to me, and I really appreciate it overall. So until the next one, cheers. When a 9% beer is chuggable, I think you've done something right.